In February, yeah. but that hating isn't necessary. You being petty because you see me rising, becoming legendary, and you talking down like you're very scary. Come on, dude. Welcome to Three Con Commentary. This is your boy Mongo Slade. Today, we're going to talk about Vice, uh, Dark Side of the Ring, uh, which is a lighthearted affair. No hepatitis, nobody dies, there's no alcoholism or child abuse or anything like that. It is just scumbags doing scumbag things in a heel program that features mudslinging. All sorts of insults, backstabbing, lying, and lawsuits. It was just a lot going on with WCW <laughs> at this time. And we're also going to talk about Vince Russo and his attempts to bait uh, Dave Meltzer into talking about his ratings. While Vince Russo is also being, uh, let's say, he's being he's lying with data. Let's put it like that. In addition, we're going to talk about pieces of the lawsuit as well. So... Let's get into it. Hopefully we won't be here forever, but I make no promises. All right. So Bash at the Beach 2000 really boils down to this. Hulk Hogan has creative control and he doesn't trust Vince Russo. That's really what it boils down to. Hogan has creative control. He doesn't trust Vince Russo. Vince Russo was brought in as the head writer of WCW, but was replaced after a couple of months. And then he brought was brought back with Eric Bischoff being kind of his overseer slash boss slash partner. It depends on who you ask in that situation. Bischoff has a tight relationship with Hogan. He did then, he does now. And he's speaking on behalf of Hulk Hogan quite a bit in this, this um, documentary because Hogan didn't want to participate. They are the three main characters of the story. And you you see the the intrigue between the three of them. Jeff Jarrett is just a guy stuck in the middle. Poor Jeff Jarrett. I mean, I really felt bad for him when you look at how he's talking about it because he's stuck in the middle. You know, he it grew up as having respect for the business. You know, his his grandma was in the business. His dad was in the business. Now he's in it. And he's put in this position where he's being told by some writer to go in there and just lay down for Hulk Hogan. In a, in a sense, to bury wrestling, you know, because Vince Russo doesn't understand it. He's just going to bury the business. And, you know, he didn't want to do that. But he also understood that Vince Russo was frustrated with Hulk Hogan and Hulk Hogan's creative control. Now, why was Hulk Hogan executing such tight creative controls? Now, this is where Meltzer comes in, because I think Meltzer actually nailed it here. He started talking about Hogan getting older. Hogan was getting a little bit older. By this point, the NWO had already faded. Uh, even bringing back the red and yellow Hulk Hogan wasn't bringing back the drawing power. So Hogan was virtually on the downslide. The uh, Vince Russo had come in with all these fresh ideas with all of these desires to push younger talent. This even brings out the Millionaires Club versus the uh, the Young Blood, or New Blood, whatever they call them, stable that they were creating between him and Bischoff and all this stuff. So the, so the writing is on the wall for Hulk Hogan that guys like him are not really appreciated anymore in WCW. So Hogan now gets a little bit defensive about his character and falls back on his creative control to control how uh, Vince Russo writes his character. Now, Bischoff is essentially a Hogan stooge. I don't like to talk about the guy that way, but it is what it is. He's the one who gave Hogan creative control. He's the one who's standing up for Hogan and everything that Hogan does in this documentary. So for the, for the purposes of this conversation, Eric Bischoff is a Hulk Hogan stooge. Okay, now we got this. They go to uh, negotiate. They're trying to figure out how to end the Hogan-Jarrett match. Everybody wants something different. Bischoff, he wants what Hogan wants because Hogan's his guy. Russo wants Jarrett to walk out with the title because the plan is for Jarrett to lose to Booker T. That's his plan. That's what he's got in his mind. Hogan doesn't care about what Vince Russo wants to do. Hogan wants what Hogan wants. Hogan wants to win. So now you have this idea where Vince Russo is trying to pitch all of these different ideas in which Hogan does not win the title without losing the match. So it's probably some kind of disqualification nonsense that he's pitching in these meetings, right? Vince Russo believes that Hulk Hogan is okay with his second draft of the match, which is that Hogan would beat up a hundred people, 
come out looking like an absolute uh, Conan the Barbarian, but he would not win the title. Hogan, he may have agreed in that meeting, but then afterwards he sent a fax saying that he did not agree, and he sent this fax through his attorney, which lets you know he was serious about this. At this point, Vince Russo completely ignores the fax, claims that he didn't see it, and goes into Bash at the Beach believing that Hulk Hogan is going to uh, let Jarrett walk out of that match with the title. He finds out that day, apparently, or the weekend of, that Hogan wants to win. And that's the end of, that's what he wants. And since he has creative control, there's nothing Vince Russo can do. This need leads to Vince Russo going to Jeff Jarrett and saying, since he wants to win so badly, just go in there and lay down for him. So now he's put Jared in this bad situation. Now, Vince Russo claimed that Hogan knew this was going to happen. And this was the idea that was pitched to Hogan. That Hogan would pin Jared with one foot on the chest. Then Hogan would get mad, storm out. Him and Bischoff would leave. Then Russo would cut a promo on Hogan. And Hogan would then quit, quote unquote, WCW. And then they would have a tournament for the new world title that would lead to Halloween Havoc. And then Hogan would make his triumphant return. And then there would be champion versus champion from that point forward. That's the idea that Hulk Hogan got in his mind because that's what Vince Russo pitched to him. So it, what ends up happening is everything up to Jarrett going to lay down in the ring happens. It's That's what Hogan wanted. Hogan wanted to win. Didn't care if Jarrett got any offense in. The point was for Jarrett to look stupid, basically. And he went in there and he did it. Hogan and Bischoff, they leave as planned. Then Vince Russo comes back out later, cuts this promo on Hogan, where he disses Hulk Hogan about how Hulk Hogan has been holding people down. He's a bald son of a bitch, all this kind of stuff. You'll never see that son of a bitch again, yada, yada, yada. And Hogan doesn't know that this is going on. He thinks that, hey, our part of the story is working out. Uh, they're going to start this tournament or whatever, and I'm going to pop back up at Halloween Havoc. Turns out, nope. <laughs> Vince Russo books Jeff Jarrett to wrestle Booker T the same night and put the title on Booker T, which again, Hulk Hogan did not approve. So because Hulk Hogan has creative control over storylines, he also has creative control over storylines that involve him and that affect him. Which means technically Vince Russo should not have been able to switch the title without Hogan's knowledge considering the title was tied up in a Hulk Hogan storyline. At least that's my understanding of Hulk Hogan's creative control and that it was that wide. Now Hogan gets to wherever his destination is and he's being called, Bischoff is being called, they're all being told about this promo that Vince Russo cut in the ring. Now, Vince Russo is under the belief that Hogan has approved for Vince Russo to come out and cut a promo. Now, Vince Russo, because even though he's a script writer, he is not working without with a script. He's just going out there and essentially shooting on Hulk Hogan. And because nobody knows what's going on, nobody knows whether this is real or not. So Hogan doesn't know whether it's real or not. He just knows that this part of the story, which is the promo and the Booker T. Jarrett stuff does is not anything that he approved. Therefore, he's upset, and he's going to file a lawsuit against WCW. So he files a lawsuit for a defamation of character and breach of contract. Now, we get to another part of the discussion that Hogan claims. Hogan claims that he was supposed to get a phone call from Vince Russo the next day, informing him of what the next steps for this storyline would be so that he would be, even though he wouldn't be on TV at the time, because of course he would be waiting for Halloween Havoc. He would want to know what other people are going to be doing. He never got that phone call. And he said he never got that phone call because Vince Russo, of course, never called him. Vince Russo claims he never called Hulk Hogan because Brad Siegel, who is the, I think the president of the network at the time, did not want Hogan on the TV anymore because Hogan costs too much per show. So Vince Russo believes that he talked to Brad Siegel 
And Brad Siegel does not want Hulk Hogan on the show anymore because Hulk Hogan costs too much per show. And he was inflating the cost of the shows. Now, there's a problem with that. The problem with that is Hulk Hogan's contract. His WCW contract requires WCW to use Hulk Hogan on a certain number of pay-per-views, nitros, and thunders per year. If they don't meet that quota, he can sue them for breach of contract. And that's exactly what he did. Now, what ends up happening is in March of 2001, Hulk Hogan gets uh, a note from WCW telling him to return on March the 18th. Hogan completely ignores that because he was not utilized throughout the rest of 2000. And he says that there were no storylines that which involved his character, so he was not going to appear. Now, WCW, of course, uses that to try to defend themselves against the breach of contract lawsuit, saying that Hogan refused to work. Now, to get a little specific, I don't know how many Nitros he was supposed to be on or how many Thunders, but he was supposed to be on six pay-per-view events in the year 2000. Six events per year. Hogan had only worked two. So you could tell at this time that they were phasing him out. So Bash, had, even if he had showed up at Halloween Havoc, it had only been three. All right. He would have had to been on the, the last three events in order for them to make that six for the year quota. So because they didn't meet their quota, Hogan sued them for breach of contract and actually won. Uh, so that's the thing. Defamation, Hogan loses because Vince Russo was talking about a fictional character and you cannot defame a fictional character. Also, they decided that um, Vince Russo did not have actual malice towards Hulk Hogan when he made these comments, that Vince Russo was making these comments in character to another character on a kayfabe show. So Hogan loses the defamation case to Vince Russo, but it was just Hogan being a dick. Now, a lot of people, especially after watching this documentary, believes that Hogan saw the writing on the wall. He saw that he was being downsized in the company and saw one more opportunity to get a big payday through a lawsuit. And that's why he sued. But if you actually knew about the lawsuit and you looked at it, you could tell that the contract that Bischoff signed Hogan to says what it says. You have to use him for six pay-per-views a year. If you only use him in two, you didn't meet your quota. He can sue you for breach of contract. So you can say that Hogan was wrong for suing WCW, but he wasn't. He was supposed to make a certain nut in that year. You didn't give it to him. So now you're owing money. It's that simple. No matter who says it, whether Vince Russo say, oh, I got it from Brad Siegel or whatever. That does not the point. The point is Hogan's contract stated he was supposed to be on six events per year. This event was in July, by the way. So that means you could have gotten your six events out of the way before July, and then you would have been done with it, right? But he had only been on two pay-per-views that entire year. So they needed to bring him in four, and he wasn't utilized anymore. So they were right. to uh, They were right on both counts. They were right that Vince Russo was uh, cutting a promo on a character in character, even if what he was saying was a shoot. It was still enough gimmick around it that it would be believable that it was a work. Now, of course, of course, Vince Russo argues that it was a work the entire time, but Hogan claims he didn't know anything about it. Therefore, it wasn't a work, but the court decided it was a work. And even if Hogan didn't know it, there was no malice and you can't define Hulk Hogan. He was never talking about Terry Bollea, who was the person. So that was essentially the long and the short of it in terms of Bash at the Beach. Okay. Russo says that he went to people and asked them who, who they want to be the champion. He said Booker T. Uh, you know, they said Booker T, Booker T, Booker T deserves it. And that meant to him that Booker T had to be the champion immediately instead of, hey, how can we work to Booker T being the champion? And he just wanted to do it right now, which is typical Vince Russo. You know, he... You know, just can't keep his spurs from jangling and jangling. You know, Bischoff being a Hogan stooge and basically knowing that Hogan is not going to go for any of this stuff because it involves Hulk Hogan losing and he doesn't want to lose or it involves Hulk Hogan being moved to the side and he doesn't want to be moved to the side. Now, when you also got to take into account this thing, Vince Russo had also made very public comments about uh, foreign talent, um, about how he doesn't care about 
Japanese wrestlers or he doesn't care about Mexican wrestlers. And upon seeing when he came in, how he downgraded the foreign talent. And that's what got him sued by Sonny Ono. So Hogan sees a pattern of behavior. You know, Vince Russo makes a comment about foreign talent. He starts divesting in the foreign talent. So now he's talking about older talent. And now we're starting to divest from the older talent. And Hogan knows where he sits in this situation as, you know, he is getting older and he's not, you know, his name isn't as drawing as much as he had been. He had tried working with younger guys. I think this was after he worked with Kidman. It just didn't work out. Hogan was just not going to work anymore. And he knew that. He was smart. Hogan was a guy who, uh, he said, you know, everybody else plays checkers. Hogan was playing chess. Absolutely. And he played chess like a motherfucker on this bash at the beach tip because he knew what Vince, Vince Russo was trying to do. Also take this into account. Vince Russo has been one of these guys that has constantly talked about the Montreal screw job and that he was in on it. So he is a guy who has bragged about how he was in the middle of the Montreal screw job and how it was his idea to fuck over Brett because Brett was in the exact same position that Hogan was in. Brett didn't want to lose to Sean. Hogan didn't want to lose to Jeff. What's, what's your, your best option to do some kind of shoot maneuver in order to get us out of this situation to double cross the talent and leave them looking stupid on television is a classic Vince Russo decision. I'm not saying that Vince Russo was the mastermind behind the Montreal screw job. I'm not saying that I'm saying that he put himself in the position to be considered the mastermind of the Montreal screw job. And thus, when people don't trust Vince Russo on a personal level or with their careers, they're right. They are right. If they don't want to trust Vince Russo, they are right. Because of what Vince Russo himself has said and done. So tell me, this is what, a little over a year after the Montreal screw job and Hogan is in the same position that, you know, Brett was in. Now, Brett's in WCW at this point in time, right? He's, he's already there. So him and Hogan aren't exactly friends, but Hogan knows what happened to Brett. He's not stupid. So Hogan was ahead of the curve. He saw this bullshit coming and <laughs> you can't be mad at him. Look, I know everybody's running around saying that Hogan's an egotist and he was a com being completely selfish in this situation. It's like either be selfish or be obsolete. Which one did you, what's your, what's your choice here? When all of you guys listen to everybody else's takes on this and how they destroy Hulk Hogan and how he sucks and yada, yada, yada. His option was to be obsolete, which is pushed out of the business by Vince Russo and a guy who had, you know, damaged several brands. This is Vince Russo who destroyed the brand of Dr. Death Steve Williams by booking the brawl for all. Again, you cannot look at this situation in a vacuum and say Hulk Hogan was wrong. Look at Vince Russo and look at the body of work Vince Russo had walking into WCW. Walking into WCW, he was dumb enough to think that the WWF was going to push Bart Gunn because he won the brawl for all. He was dumb enough to book the brawl for all in the first place. He was dumb enough to, to, to put himself in the middle of the Montreal screw job as a person who cannot be trusted. Why would you trust Vince Russo? So if you don't trust Vince Russo, how can you blame Hulk Hogan? How can you blame Hulk Hogan? Look at what Hulk Hogan has done throughout his career and then put yourself in his shoes. Now, Vince Russo, this guy who is an absolute scumbag, comes into the company, has already fucked over Bret Hart, already fucked over Dr. Death Steve Williams, who knows how many other people he's fucked with throughout his entire career, and now, you know, I don't know the context of what he was doing in WCW, because I don't remember WCW 2000 that well, but I'm pretty sure there were some legends on that roster that was probably being mis mishandled at that point in time. I know he completely mishandled Goldberg too. I'm talking about Vince Russo by turning Goldberg heel. He did stuff to people that damaged their brand. So don't look at this situation in a vacuum and say that Hulk Hogan should not have used his creative control. He should have used his creative control. He was 100% right in doing so. Vince Russo cannot be trusted. Now let's flip the other coin real quick. You're Vince Russo. You want to try to 
rebuild WCW is in a slump. You can't keep pushing the same guys over and over again. For Christ's sake, it's 1999, not 1989. Hulkamania cannot still be running wild. We need to find some way of moving this stuff along, of getting Hogan out of the way, or in some way reinvigorating Hulk Hogan. Now, he's becoming pretty intractable in his position that he needs to be the champion or needs to be in a top storyline. So you're in a situation in which Eric Bischoff, who is technically your boss, technically, is 100% pro Hogan and Hogan's being a dick. How are you going to get out of this situation? That is going to take some creativity, right? That's going to take some ingenuity. That's going to take some hard work. But... But Vince Russo fell backwards into something. Hogan was willing to leave the show on the belief that he was going to end up returning later on. Okay, so then you just say, continue doing what you were going to do. You do what you were, pro- what you promised the guy you were going to do. You get him to trust you. You get him to show they know you're not the guy that you know was screwing over people in the past. Yes, you have reverence and respect for him, but you also need to understand that we need to move into the 2000s and you need to do something different. And he needs to give you the space in order to do that. Now, I'm not saying you sit down and talk to Hogan like he's a little kid. What I'm saying is you look at the situation and you're saying Hogan's willing to leave television for several weeks. He's willing to leave from July to October. All right. He's willing to leave throughout that time as part of a storyline. All right, so that from, from that point forward, you have all this time to play and build up new people and do different things. You didn't have to deal with the Hulk Hogan problem for a while. You had to keep him in the loop, for sure. And yes, maybe Hulk Hogan was going to have to have some kind of input if he wanted to have like a world title thing or whatever. Or he might have wanted to have some input on the, on the storyline of the tournaments or whatever the case may be. Maybe that's, you know, maybe that's a problem. But that's a small problem in comparison to, let's say, getting sued. That's a, a small problem. Ha- keeping Hogan in the loop, it's a small problem compared to getting sued. It's a small problem compared to getting the company sued. Uh, so Vince Russo, his balls were in a vice in this situation, okay? Hogan was intractable. He wasn't going to move on this subject. Um, Bischoff is a stooge for Hogan, so you can't really talk to him. And so, and you want to move forward. How can you get the business to move forward? How can you get the company to move forward while Hulk Hogan is in the way? And Bischoff, who is technically one of your bosses, is on Hogan's side 100% stooging for him. So now you got two, you are in a situation where it's two on one. Now, some people would say Vince Russo probably should have just quit and let somebody else handle it. Kevin Sullivan was probably still there. Let him deal with this. And then, you know, whatever. I say you look at the situation, you take the small victories. Small victory. Hogan was willing to leave television on his own under the auspices of this storyline. So between early July and maybe early to mid-October, Hogan was going to leave. All right. So if you if you were that frustrated with him, you were going to have a big chunk of time there. That you didn't have to deal with Hulk Hogan outside of maybe talking to him on the phone. All right. At that point, you could have had more opportunities to A, gain his trust, B, create some kind of scenario that reinvigorated Hulk Hogan, or C, you massage his suspicions. Hulk Hogan is paranoid in this situation. All right. He was right to be paranoid. Look at all the stuff Vince Russo has done so far. What you could do is assuage some of that paranoia. That's what the phone calls and stuff like that is for. It's small things. You know, like with these big stars, they want, you know, all yellow M&Ms because they want to make sure that you're paying attention to details, right? Hogan wants to know that Vince Russo is a guy who's on Team Hogan. You're on Hogan's side. Prove to Hulk Hogan that you're on his side. Now, it's not your fault that the contract is written the way that it is, and it's stupid. But... Perhaps if you can show Hulk Hogan that you are factoring him in, you are taking into account what he's done in the business, you are trying to help him out, you are trying to reinvigorate the Hogan brand, maybe then 
you can convince him to do some of the things that you want to do. When, when he sees that you're openly anti Hulk Hogan, you're going into business for yourself. Even if you say, well, bro, I thought this, I thought that bro. It's like you're dealing with somebody who's extremely paranoid. You can't do stuff like this. And I understand from this predicament, Vince Russo was never going to succeed. He's not the kind of person who could have succeeded in this situation. He just couldn't do it. So he was always destined to fail in this, in this program here. It was not going to work. All right. Hogan was too damn suspicious and too damn crafty. Russo was too damn blunt. He was too much of a loud mouth. He overplayed his hand too many times. He probably ran his mouth way too much. And Hogan was up on game. You know, that, that's the thing. Hogan was up on Vince Russo's game. Dealing with somebody like Hulk Hogan, I know there's a lot of people who are going to be listening to this and they're going to say, you, you're doing a lot of mental gymnastics. Hulk Hogan is selfish, yada, yada, yada. Understand, if you're the head coach of a basketball team and you got a LeBron James or a Michael Jordan or a Tom Brady or something like that, or, you know, those guys do get older. You do have to try to make a decision to do you keep these guys around? How do you phase them out? What do you do? You're in that same situation with, with this guy. You know, Hulk Hogan is the Michael Jordan of pro wrestling. How do you phase out Michael Jordan? How do you move past Michael Jordan or LeBron James or Kobe Bryant or, you know, uh, a Tom Brady or something like that? How do you let a big name marquee talent uh, go? How do you let him go? And in sports, it's a lot easier. Like I said, you know, there's new athletes every year. And even athletes are a little bit more realistic. You know, real, that's not to say real athletes, football players, basketball players, etc. They are more knowledgeable about their obsolete date. Wrestlers tend to hang on forever. And Hogan was, was, you know, I think he was like in his late 40s, maybe 50s at this point in time. He wasn't completely old and decrepit. You know, and wrestlers have been known to go in their 70s and their 60s and stuff like that. So he was still holding on. But the bottom line is, if Vince Russo was not the kind of guy who could work with talent, he was never going to get over with Hulk Hogan. He had to be a businessman and he was not one. He would have had to be smarter than he actually is. He would have had to, you know, uh, show patience and show sympathy more than he actually did. This again, Hulk Hogan is watching Vince Russo mock Jim Ross. All right. He's watching him make a mockery of Bill Goldberg. He's watching him make a mockery of a lot of things that were built up in WCW. He sees him trying to push talent who's never drawn a goddamn dime. He looking at Vince Russo and saying to himself, put my career in the hands of this guy? No way. Again, looking at it realistically, you wouldn't have wanted to be Hulk Hogan in that situation. You wouldn't have wanted to be Hulk Hogan in that situation. You would have did the same damn thing, if we're being honest. That's why I don't blame Hogan. But Vince Russo, I understand his situation too. If you're in his situation, you're fucked. You're in his situation because you're fucked because contracts exist before you got there that stipulate to things that you can't, you shouldn't be able to agree to because you want to be able to use characters and stories the way that you want to use characters and stories. But now you're limited, not just by the company, but also by the contractual obligations to talent. And then Hulk Hogan was just one of those talent. When you take into account how much money some of these guys were making, and how much respect they had earned throughout their entire career. I'm talking like guys like Flair and Sting and Savage and Luger and all these guys. Even if they didn't have the same creative control clauses as Hulk Hogan. They probably had something in their contract that was a nightmare to deal with. And you didn't create any of those situations. So you're in a situation where if you're Vince Russo, you're being asked to finish somebody else's murder mystery. Okay, Bischoff started this nonsense. But now Bischoff is on the outs. He's not the writer anymore. You are. And you have to now try to write using Bischoff's entrenched characters. That's impossible to do. Like, that's a headache to deal with. How can you write a story? It's just like working in Marvel Comics and they demand that you write Spider-Man a certain way. You know, that's very limiting. 
You know, I know there's a lot of people who say, I wish that was the case today, but that's kind of how editorial mandates work. They want to be utilized or want their properties utilized in a certain way. And you as the writer have to capitulate to that. That's part of you taking the job. You taking the job basically says that you're going to use the characters in a certain way. And agreeing to do that job basically meant that Vince Russo had to do this. Capitulate to Hulk Hogan as much as possible. You have to uh, restrain your vision as much as possible or amend it to include Hulk Hogan more than you probably wanted it to. Due to editing magic, we're going to insert this part into my review of Dark Side of the Ring. David Penzer, who was the ring announcer and kind of stooge in WCW, also uh, added a little bit of context to what happened. So David Penzer responded after watching the episode. So just watch Dark Side of the Ring. Pleasantly surprised that after 25 years, they adjusted their story to the truth. On Thursday, Terry Taylor told me to call Booker T and tell him he was winning the belt on Sunday and bring a suit for Nitro. That was the plan all along. Then he said he was happy to answer any questions. So let's start right here. This means that Vince Russo and the entire writing staff had planned to make Booker T the champion, regardless of what they told Hulk Hogan. So they lied to Hulk Hogan about what they were going to do. Amazing. So a fan asked David Penzer, so what's the part about no new champion planned that night and instead a tournament leading to Halloween Havoc inaccurate? Last night was the first I ever heard of that last part. David Penzer responded, that's because Jeff Jarrett didn't know, but Russo did. Conrad told Jeff on his podcast, my version, and I guess they knew after that they needed to tell the truth. Oh, so Russo was lying the entire time. So here's the one. A fan asked him, so Vince was telling the truth. He says, I don't know about the Hulk Jarrett stuff, but Booker was leaving with the belt. Only problem is until now, Russo said it was going to be a tournament, which was 100% untrue. So you can't trust Vince Russo. <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> Big, big surprise, right? You can't trust Vince Russo. He's a goddamn liar. So David Penzer is asked again, did Bischoff and Hogan know Terry Taylor told Booker he was winning the belt? David Penzer responded, actually, I told Booker. Terry Taylor told me to call him. I know now that Jeff didn't know, and I doubt Hulk and Eric did too, but Russo definitely knew and lied about it until he knew what I did. Hmm. Wow. Amazing. Look, David Penzer is a guy, you know, I, I, I have no reason to question his his integrity, right? There's no reason to, to question David Penzer's integrity. Why would we be mad at David Penzer? There's no reason to, right? So why would he lie on Vince Russo? We don't know. Everybody's favorite um, drooling journalist, David Bixenspan, decided to jump into this same situation and said, quote, did Terry Taylor not make the call himself because of his past issues with Booker? Who cares? What difference does it make? Uh, Bate Penzer says, actually, I'm 99% sure that there were no issues with Hulk and Booker. It was more about not trusting Russo going forward. And he says, I'm sorry I met Terry Taylor. He says, I honestly don't remember issues with Terry Taylor and Booker. That's my truth. In my job, I was asked by Terry to call many wrestlers and give them updates. I was kind of the stooge, but I still had the time of my life. Bix and Spence just starts talking about Bischoff and discrimination lawsuits, which of course have nothing to do with this, but because it might bring us a modicum of entertainment. Let's get into it. He says, quote, Eric testified about it during the deposition of the discrimination lawsuits that Terry had made racially hostile at best, what's public isn't very specific, comments to Booker and Stevie that they ran up the chain within WCW. Penzer responded, if so, that's horrible. I just never heard it. That said, it wasn't awkward for me to make calls. Don't have any other info or any discrimination lawsuit. Sorry. So, typical mudslinger, uh, Bixen Span, takes an opportunity where this guy's talking about Bash at the Beach to talk about something else and try to create more <laughs> than 
the guy wanted to actually participate in. Amazing. But at least we know now, for a fact, that trusting Vince Russo was a mistake. And that Hulk Hogan was actually fucking right the entire time to never trust Vince Russo. And yes, it fucked Jeff Jarrett. Yes, it fucked some other people. But guess what? You can't trust Vince Russo. He was planning to double cross Hulk Hogan the whole fucking time. Wow. Now, here is a little bit of a twist. Vince Russo fans are now saying that Russo always told this story that Vince said Booker T was going to walk out with the title. They even post an old shoot interview where Vince Russo is saying just that. But it's over 10 years old. So now what David Penzer is saying is that Vince Russo's change to admitting that Booker T was supposed to be the champion the whole time. That was the revision that basically before Vince Russo admitted in public that Booker T was supposed to be the champion coming out of Bash at the Beach. He was always telling people that the plan was a tournament. So despite the fact that he's now telling the truth and probably been telling the truth for a long time now, he was initially lying until David Penzer went public. This is the first that most of us have ever heard of it. That doesn't mean it's the first time Vince Russo has heard it. And also not the first time Vince Russo has talked about Bash at the Beach. So this is a very entertaining story. I just wanted to edit this in here because I didn't want to leave nothing out that might be important to how you think about the story. So let me know what you think now and let's go into Russo lying about his ratings. Because he lies about everything, apparently. <laughs> Speaking of Vince Russo, Vince Russo got an advanced copy of Vice's Dark Side of the Ring and he went on a tweeting spree about it. And now we're going to talk about Vince Russo's tweets in relation to Dark Side of the Ring. So his first tweet was this. Just watched an advanced copy of Vice's Back at the Beach. Honestly, I felt they missed a few key pieces, but there is only so much you can cover in an hour. I just think that it's unfortunate that as grown men, there are still some that call names and throw around insults like it's third grade all over again. I'm proud that I chose not to go down that road and just factually tell the story. Even though... I knew I would be attacked by certain individuals. That sophomoric behavior is what always give wrestling a bad name. Okay, that's not too bad. Then he says, for those who are going to watch Vice's Bash at the Beach, I am posting the URL from the actual court decision so you can clearly see that all my comments were all factual as they pertained to the results of the defamation case. Somehow the facts always seem to get in the way. Of what? Nobody ever, I don't who questioned the, uh, the defamation case. I don't see how any, who questioned it. I don't know. Besides the fact that Lance Storm has been personally attacking me for 20 years now, simply because he didn't agree with the way I presented professional wrestling. I have to ask, why was he part of Vice's Bash at the Beach? He had nothing to do with anything. He knew nothing. So why was he on there? Once you see it, you can answer for yourself. It's just how shit works. You ha just have to be smart to it. I don't understand why. Is, I mean, I get why he's attacking uh, Lance Storm. Lance Storm did call his ideas stupid. That is true. <laughs> um, because, and this is the stupid thing. And this is a Vince Russo, a regular Vince Russo thing during this era. Vince Russo was obsessed with working the boys. All right. Lance Storm, what he said in this documentary was that he didn't understand why uh, Jeff Jarrett laid down in the ring. He said, if it was a work, it's stupid. It was a shoot. It was even dumber, you know, which is a fact. It, it was a stupid decision to have Jeff Jarrett lay in the ring. It was a dumb decision, whether it was a shoot or a work. And the idea that he was trying to work the boys, he was trying to get over on the boys. Like the boys don't buy the tickets. What are you talking? They're not buying the merchandise. They're not the ones watching on television. Why are you want This is a guy who booked the brawl for all because he was mad at Bradshaw. Again, trying to work the boys, trying to upset the boys, get, you know, trying to, you know, put the boys in their place. That's the wrong, wrong approach to business. The business is about the fans, always about the fans. It's not about the boys. It's not about the office. 
It's not about impressing the boys or impressing the office. It's about impressing the fans. Who gives a fuck if you got over on the boys? Who cares if the boys can see through it? The idea that, oh, there needs to be a blur of reality is like, yes, but we're still supposed to know that it's not real. That's the thing. You can blur lines and still say it's firmly a work. All right. When the, when the boys don't know whether it's a work or not, this is what happens. Your idea that, well, I wanted to work shoot. So nobody, somebody, so nobody got shoot mad and I got shoot sued. And yeah, you were lucky to, to win the defamation case, but you sh- don't shoot on the boys. You don't try to work the boys. What, what benefit is it to work in the boys? I don't get that. But let's continue uh, what he says. He says, quote, Dave Meltzer referred to me as dishonest on Vice's Bash at the Beach documentary. He went on to say that Nitro ratings went down the first three months I was there. Let's put Dave's bullshit to bed once and for all. Here are the actual real numbers. Anyone can look up Nitro ratings from six weeks before I got there. My first 13 weeks, 11 weeks after I left. These are the real numbers. Look them the fuck up. Who's dishonest, Dave? I don't make statements unless I know I can back them up with facts. So tired of the liars, con men, carnies of professional wrestling. Everyone retweet this to stop the lying bullshit. And so he, he drops a list of uh, shows from the, uh, from September the ninth, uh, 6, 1999 to October 11th, 1999. The average, this was before Vince Russo got there was an average of 3.17 with Vince Russo. He said October 18th, 1999 to January the 10th, 2000. The average was a 3.21. So a 0.04 increase in the average ratings. That's a, a rounding error. Vince Russo was making a lot of money, by the way. He's making over a million dollars in the, at this point in time. And he is doing a victory lap because the ratings went up. Point zero four, which is essentially a rounding error. That literally meant nothing to advertising, nothing to merchandise, <laughs> nothing to other forms of business. A point zero four. So he continues by uh, posting uh, when he left. So January seventeenth, two thousand to March twenty seventh, two thousand. The average was. A 2.78. So when he left, the ratings went down substantially. That's Vince Russo's argument for how he's a he's a draw. You know, you're not taking into account the amount of damage he dealt to the company at that point in time. Now, what I want to do is, since Vince Russo was talking about ratings, let's talk about ratings. Um, Guy Evans, in the book Nitro, actually broke down the ratings for... WCW Nitro while Vince Russo was in control, but he didn't just break down the ratings. He also broke down overall business. So he broke uh, Vince Russo's run into three parts. One called the powers that be era in which he was working with Ed Ferrara. This would be from October 18th, 1999 to January 10th, 2000. During this time, there were 13 episodes of Nitro, and he compared those 13, the average rating of those 13 episodes of Nitro to the previous 13, not the previous six, the previous 13, right? And he found that it was a slight decrease in viewership across those uh, 13 episodes. So uh, Russo's Nitro was a 321 and the dec- uh, the original, the 3.13 weeks before Vince Russo took over, was a 3.24. So a 0. .03 difference. That's not in Russo's favor. And this is not, you know, this is the same amount of shows in the same time period. Right? So the second part is called the Dream Team Era, where he's working with Eric Bischoff. So this is where Bischoff comes in, he's taken over, and he's overseeing Vince Russo, and this includes Bash at the Beach 2000. This goes from uh, April 10th, 2000 to June 14th, 2000. 
And what you get from there is that uh, Nitro averaged a 2.9 rating during this era. That's 10 Nitros. This was an increase over the previous 10 uh, Nitros, which was a 2.76. So a healthy, I think, a uh, 1.14 increase thereabouts. All right. So that's not too bad. The third era is called the Blaze of Glory era, which is, you know, Vince Russo's uh, run, which I think included David Arquette and I think himself becoming world champion or something like that. Um, this is from July the 10th, 2000 to October 2nd, 2000. So from July 10th, 2000 to October 2nd, 2000, there were 12 nitros. Um, Russo had a 2.84 at this time. And he says, um, that was essentially, it, well, I guess you can't compare it to the previous because the previous still had Russo. <laughs> it wasn't enough to compare it to the previous. Okay. So there wasn't enough, um, other data to compare it to like other times there was, you could compare 13 to 13. There was not enough time on the other side without Russo to decide whether um, it went down or up in comparison to Russo being there or not. But you can look at this and tell that the ratings had gone down from the previous era, meaning that if you look at Nitro, again, during this particular era, July the 10th, 2000 to October 2nd, 2000, there was an average of 2.84. This is actually down from the previous Russo era of uh, April the 10th, 2000 to June the 14th, 2000, which had a 2.9. So it was down 0.06. So it was down 0.06. That means as he went on, he was actually losing ratings. If you want further proof, let me uh, get this stuff out of the way to make it a little bit clearer for you. The powers that be, when he was writing for Air Ferrara, when he first came in, the ratings were 3.21. When Vince Russo actually left, it was a 2.84. So Nitro actually was damaged the longer Vince Russo was in control. But that wasn't it. Because Guy Evans also said that uh, pay-per-views actually went down over time as well. So from the first era that when he was writing with Air Ferrara, it says Russo produced pay-per-views averaged a buy rate of 0.43, which was slightly up from the previous three events, which had a 0.41. The next uh, buy rates was for uh, the Dream Team era where he was working with Eric Bischoff. Buy rates fell to 0.2, down from the previous three events, which was a 0.2. So it was only down uh, 0.01, which is essentially a rounding error. But the third Russo era, the buy rate was only, he only had two pay-per-views, but it was down to a 0.17. So he had degraded the pay-per-views from 0.43 down to 0.17. Pay-per-view buy rates were down. In addition to that, T- house show attendance went down. It says, furthermore, pay-per-view buy rates declined dramatically under his tenure, despite the frequent twists and turns occupying each event. Year to year, October 1999 to October 2000, monthly house show attendance fell from an average of 4,600 to 1,700 in incredibly the world heavyweight title changed hands 20 times the very definition of you had a spark when you started but now you just garbage that is vince russo's wcw tenure it started out fine compared to i mean the idea was that people expected something fresh and something new from the new wcw that vince russo was taking over some people knew that they would check it out to see what was going to be different. And maybe he over time had engaged some people, made them very interested in the product, at least initially, but over time his act wore thin and it fell apart. 
that's the nature of the business, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I know there's a lot of Vince Russo fans out there. It's going to be very upset that I said this, but it is what it is. That's why I don't like Vince Russo. He lies with data. He was there almost a year. It doesn't matter what the, the previous administration was doing and how you improved upon it. It's okay. You improved it, but did it stick? The answer is no. For starters, you were in and out. That was already a problem because there was no consistency in the booking because you couldn't handle the backstage politics. You couldn't handle the talent. You couldn't handle the scheduling. You couldn't handle anything. So you kept popping in and popping out. And you want, you want to take credit for certain things and then not for others. But if you look at everything, which I think Guy Evans did a fair job of, a much fairer job than Vince Russo did, Every business metric that matters outside of maybe merchandise, and I don't know how, how merchandise did, went down under Vince Russo. So no wonder they tried to sell the goddamn company. This guy was there for almost a year. He was there for, what, 355 days. I don't think he made 365. But it was a, it was a year, all right? <laughs> it was a year. He was there for a year. And in that year, he tanked their pay-per-view business. I'm sorry. What more can you do? All right. The ratings went down over time. And then here's the craziest thing. He is arguing against Dave Meltzer. Dave Meltzer said in the documentary, this is what Vince Russo was responding to, that if you look at month to month, the ratings went down. So what he's saying is if you compare October of 98 to October of 99, ratings went down. If you compare November of 98 to November of 99, he's not saying, look at these 13, uh, which is what even what Guy Evans did. Guy Evans said, okay, let's look at the first, the last 13 Nitros before Vince Russo got there. And then look at the 13 that Vince Russo covered during this point in time, which is, I think is fair, but Meltzer is even being even fairer in this situation. Cause he's saying, let's just look at October of 98 compared to October of 99. Now there was not that much comparison to be made because Russo only worked two shows of October of 99. So just let's, let's just take a look at one of the months. Let's take a look at November. November 98 and November 99. And let's see which one has a higher overall rating. Just to see if Vince Russo is correct or if Dave Moser is correct. I have no dog in the fight. I, do, I dislike both of them. But I took a look. Let's see. November 1998, November the 2nd, Nitro scored a 4.8 in the ratings. November the 9th, 4.1. November the 16th, 4.3. November the 23rd, 4.5, and November the 30th, 4.2. It's a pretty goddamn good numbers. Vince Russo in November of 1999. So a year later, year over year, like Meltzer was saying, compared by month. November the 1st, 3.2. November the 8th, 3.4. November the 15th, 3.1. November 22nd, 3.4. And November 29th, 3.1. Well, I'm sorry, Meltzer was right. If you look November 98 to November 99, the ratings had gone down. Was that Russo's fault? Who knows? But Russo is wrong. All right. If you look at Meltzer, what he said, month over month, year over year, the ratings went down. You cannot blame Russo if you want to, but it's true. Year over year, the ratings went down. But Mongo, you're taking it out of context. Fuck that. December of 98. Since you want to push my buttons, December of 98. December the 7th, 4.2. December 14th, 4.2. December 21st, 4.0. December 28th, 4.6. Now, December of 99, where Vince, where Vince Russo is in charge, November, December the 6th, Three, three, December the 13th, 2.8, December the 20th, 3.2, December 27th, 2.9. There's just no way of cutting it. Vince Russo, 
lost ratings year over year. You can blame, you can blame whatever you want. It's the facts remain. I'm not about to do this all night. All right. I think I just, I was fair. I, 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 I disregarded October because October is unfair. Russo was not there in October. He was, he came in the middle of the month. So that was four to two, not fair, but he was there all in November. He was there all in December year over year. He lost ratings. And this, this is the facts. These are the facts. And unfortunately, he making me side with Dave Meltzer with his absolute ridiculous comment. That was a ridiculous comment. This idea that he's going to continuously uh, do podcasts and Q and A's and all this kind of stuff, trying to disprove Meltzer. It's like, look, man, do the best you can, but tell the truth. That's what you promised. You promised in your tweets that you were going to tell the truth. You can say WCW was in a very different place in 98. It was so much stronger as a brand. Everything was going smoothly. It was clicking. They had Goldberg. They had, you know, the remnants of the, uh, of the, of the uh, NWO stuff still going on. There was still some good stuff in WCW in 98. 99, things hit the skids. We were kind of losing control. Things got hard. It was hard for me to pull things back up. You could say I was doing better than other people were doing in 99. That's fine. But <laughs> Melzer is comparing you to 98. That's what he's doing. He's comparing you to the year before. But the fact that Vince Russo and seemingly all the Vince Russo sycophants can't figure that part out blows my mind. Literally blows me to smithereens how you can't figure out that it's year over year that he's looking at. He's not talking about if you compare October to August. That's not what he's comparing to. He's talking year over year. He said, he's literally said, compare October to October. Russo is such an unfathomable cunt that he makes me need to, I want to brush my teeth. After defending Meltzer for the past, I don't know, what was it, six minutes or whatever. The guy was right, all right? It is what it is. You being an unbearable cunt about TV ratings when you didn't do the best ratings of all time in WCW, it's okay. I'm sorry that that's your legacy is that you're the ratings guy and you didn't do it better than everybody. Guess what? WCW was booting WWF in the ass when you were the head writer there too. It is what it is. There was a small point of time where Vince Russo was writing dominated wrestling. That was a very small portion of time. When he took over as head writer in WWF, WCW had their foot firmly in WWF's ass. And that's for a lot of his run while he was there. All right. Again, he took over. He left in 99. The upswing took place in late 97, early, I mean, in 98. So he really only had a year and some change of success in WWF as it being the number one global brand, which it was before he even got there. So he already had that benefit that he had Vince McMahon and he had, you know, the action figures and the video games and all that kind of stuff working for him already. This thing with Vince Russo and these TV ratings drive me fucking crazy because it's not that fucking important, especially not anymore. But this promotion is dead and that version of the WWF is dead. It's over. Why are we still talking about the ratings from the Monday Night War? Oh my God, get over it. So that's it. Bash at the Beach 2000 with a bunch of people running, had their egos running wild. It is what it is. It is what it is. The documentary was fine. You know, it, I think it was probably one of the more straightforward dark side of the rings. I, I did hear some people criticize it for being very, uh, you know, it wasn't dark. It was just sort of like a controversy. But it, it, I put it in the same category as the Montreal Screwjob where it's one of those things that you must understand if you're a wrestling fan. How people in the back are constantly trying to screw over the boys or work the boys, or whatever. And this is the one time when one of the boys had a leg up on them. Because there's quite often in these stories where the boys get fucked. And this is the one time where it didn't happen. <laughs> you know, Brett got fucked. You know, if Brett was smarter, 
and he probably would have saw the screw job coming, he might not have been not might not have fell into that hole. But there's quite a few times where talent refused to do something and then the office just fucks him. And this was one of those times where Hogan had a leg up. That's it. Sorry if Jarrett is, you know, is upset about this. But this could have all been avoided if Vince Russo had some patience. If he would have said, you know what, maybe it's not an absolute necessity for Booker T to win the title on this day. Maybe he can win it in a month. Maybe he can win it in two months. Maybe we can just put him on that track. That would have been better. But what they did was try to rush it. They microwaved it, ruined it, and then got sued. Sorry. I don't have any I don't have any sympathy for anybody in this story. I know everybody's like, oh man, but Jeff Jarrett, he didn't ask for this. He didn't ask to be in this situation. Look, Jeff Jarrett is a Vince Russo stooge. He was only in that situation because him and Vince Russo are friends. That's the only reason he was even in this situation. Jeff Jarrett should not even been on a short list of guys to be the world champion. Why we even discuss him in this conversation simply because Russo put him there. That was it. Now, we talked about Russo's ratings. We've talked about Russo's perspective. We've talked about the, all this stuff. I want to end on this. Vince Russo had no business being on television in WCW. No business. He does not have the charisma. He does not have the personality. And clearly he does not have the skills to be an on-screen character. The guy was a mark for himself, and he is. People say Bret Hart is a mark for himself, and that if you go into his house, there's just newspaper clippings of himself all over the place. Well, look, with the exception of baby facing himself to a degree, Vince Russo is no different. He talks about how he led the, the big era and all this kind of stuff, and when you look back at it, he was only there for, what, two years as, as the head writer? From 96 to 90 to mid 99. And then he started taking credit for stuff that happened in WWF when he wasn't even there. That, that was the kind of the weird thing. He wasn't there for some of the bigger shows that they did, you know, in 2000, for instance. And then it becomes, well, I wrote two years of television and it just followed what I wrote. Then why can't you do what you <laughs> couldn't fix the shit in WCW? If they could follow directions in WWF. And stick to a script you wrote supposedly while you were there and now you're gone. And now you're physically, literally writing a script in WCW and everything's falling apart. Maybe the issue ain't, <laughs> ain't them. It's you. All right. But I don't believe that anyway. I know that it comes across like I just don't like Vince Russo. But this is why I don't like Vince Russo. He makes some good points sometimes. But then he'll get ahead of himself. He'll talk about how much he hates wrestling and how wrestlers are stupid and any, all this kind of stuff. And then he'll go on about how he did all of this for the business. And you're like, okay, wait a minute, let's put it in context. Right? Let's put it in context. In context, you lost viewers over time. And that even compared to yourself. If you compare your first run to your second, you lost viewers. You lost buy rates. How show attendance went down. If you compare it to the previous year, you look absolutely pathetic. You look like a failure compared to 98. So where did you compare it to? I don't know. That's I'm dead. I'm done. Thank you guys for your time. Talk to you guys later. Dark side of the ring was very good. One of the better ones, uh, which Hogan would have been in it. But of course, you know, he wasn't going to be Wish Booker T was in it, but he really didn't have much to say because he didn't have anything to do with this. But um, I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out. Old non-aggression. Once that lesson sets in, you'll see a session. But you got an affection for no progression.